Right, so um, good morning, everyone. Uh, what I want to say today is present just a small selection of some of the results from my PhD research, which was to look at uh, how the Mesolithic period is communicated to non-academic audiences, and I took a narrative theory approach to this. So I'm really looking at narrative and the communication of a period. And I looked at a very, very small sample of museums as part of this. I looked at over 900 acts of communication, but I only looked at nine British and six continental European museums. So it's a very, very small sample. And I also have to say that the, the, the research was concluded in 2016, so it's already now out of date. I know that some of the displays I looked at have been changed and changing since I looked at them. So, with that in mind, um, what then do we mean by narrative? I looked at narrative theorists and what people have said about narrative in the field of narrative theory. Uh, here is one of the key people, Seymour Chapman, who defined narrative and set the framework for later narrative theorists in literature theory. Uh, narrative is concerned about people within particular settings doing things and being affected by things that happen within that setting to them. Okay, and so within the Mesolithic, a classic narrative of that kind would be a family coming back and it's seasonal round and finding its coastal settlement has been flooded by the rising sea levels which are drowning dock land. All the elements of narrative are there in that image. But why is narrative effective? Why do people like narratives? Well, here is Spenon and Rabinovitz, 2012, who've looked at the rhetorical aspects of narrative and they say there are three particular aspects which are important, which help people understand and get involved in narratives. There is the mimetic, how realistic is the story world that is being created? The synthetic, that is, the aesthetics of the telling of the story, how attractive is it? And the, the thematic aspect of the rhetoric of narrative, does the story have resonance for the reader or the visitor? Does it mean something to them in their own personal lives? And so uh, an illustration like this, for example, uh, would speak to visitors. It's about, this is, if you like, the Mesolithic kitchen. How you prepare your food. Everyone prepares food. Everyone likes food. I'm famous for my stomach. I love food. So everyone can relate to this. And that, that's a part of what makes narrative important. So. For the purposes of this talk, I'm simply going to focus on two particular things. I'm going to focus on how characters are depicted in the museums that I looked at, and I'm going to look at how a mimetic story world is or is not created in those museum displays. So, let's look at character. Now, in some cases, it's very easy to depict character. In the case of Chenegorge Museum, which is based around the uh, find of the young cheddar man adult male burial. You have actual human remains and a human at the site. You can base a story around. Uh, on the other hand, at the Hancock Museum in Newcastle, um, you have a character introduced as they do in parts of their displays as an etched image on the glass with a text which is her speaking directly to the visitor. Uh, and if you go to uh, the, uh, uh, the Museum of East Riding um, Archaeology in, in Hull, uh, you have the introduction of the classic mannequin figure, in this case a woman gathering in the forest as part of displays, talked about in the third person, uh, and also introducing that element of a person within the display. Um, slightly less easy and, and sort of but it allows you more creativity in some ways. Uh, this is a, the Yorkshire Museum in York, as part of the Star Farm Mesolithic displays. You have a series of panels dispersed in the exhibition with sort of cartoon-like characters and aspects of Mesolithic day life going on. You have drawn characters within the displays linking artifacts to how the artifacts might have been used. But you will also have uh, a little sort of cartoon loop produced uh, for younger visitors with a particular character and this character's journey through a particular day in the Mesolithic. So you have multiple representations of characters and individuals 
within that display. At Amesbury Local History Centre, which is where the Blick archaeological site from Mesolithic is being presented, very, very close to Stonehenge, uh, they've taken the name Amesbury and produced the character Amy as this young girl who appears in the displays at different points in history and prehistory. And Amy's story in the Mesolithic is narrated in the third person. Amy did this, Amy's parents did this, etc., etc. So they have a named person that people can relate to as part of their understanding of the displays. Right. Right. Um, now, on the continent, of course, you have also burials uh, at the National National Museum in Copenhagen, in Copenhagen. Uh, you have a presentation of actual Mesolithic human remains. But also at Bedbekrunna, uh, north of Copenhagen, where you have four particular <coughs> uh, Mesolithic individuals interred, including this one, which is a famous one from Bedbek, of a young woman by age roughly 18 or 19 on the skeleton evidence, with a young newborn baby, died in childbirth, both of them laid out on a swan's wing underneath her. And it's a very, very evocative, very emotive. Uh, sort of set of physical remains and introduces a character there that is a real wow sort of factor for the visitor of the audience and very empathetic, really touches that emotional core. But not many museums are able to do that. They are lucky in having this kind of find that they can do this, this on. Elsewhere on the continent, uh, human characters are sort of eluded to in really quite sort of interesting sort of ways on the edges, as it were. Uh, at the Göteborg Stars Museum in Göteborg in, in Sweden. Uh, this is a Nappers stone, uh, as excavated with flint around it, with spaces where the feet of the Napper would have been, and the Napper sitting on the stone, just having left and gone away for his or her lunch, something like that. So the, the character isn't there, but it is there in their absence, which is a very nice way of, of, of placing the character. At Bedbeck Fundener, there are aspects of the natural world and the interaction between humans and animals, in this case hunting. And we see from the side of the case the arrows flying in from off camera. And the suggestion of people there actually doing the hunting, but you're not seeing the people. So again, they're alluded to. At the Earth Walk, I should also say that there is a slightly more direct representation of people. The, 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 the cases are laid out uh, in a sort of with a surround that goes around them, coloured like sand, and in the sand you just make out there are human footprints in the sand walking through and between the cases. Um, in the Schloss Gotthof, um, in Schleswig, in Schleswig Holstein, um, we have within the, within the um, display cases with lots of flint, um, and I am an ex flint expert, so I do read. I really, really enjoy flint, and I apologise for that, it's just one of those things. Um, you, you find uh, drawings of hands and arms performing tasks. You don't see the, per the people that go with these hands and arms. So again, it's a suggestion of, a, of an individual and a character sort of off camera, which I think is a very neat way of doing it. Uh, and the, one of these sites I went to, which is near Leiden in the Netherlands, Archeon, uh, it's not a traditional museum, it's an open-air living history site where they've recreated sites which have been excavated from around the Netherlands, all based on archaeological evidence, and where they have people in role, dressed according to the period, with whom the visitors can interact. And a lot of these people are themselves archaeologists who work on a lot of these periods and a lot of these sites. And so you get a real person pretending to be a Mesolithic person with whom people can, can interact. And it's, it's really quite a, I was quite blown away by the whole archaeal experience, I, 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 I have to admit. Uh, now, one of the things that was interesting that came out of my research was, and you will not be surprised by this, and many of you will already know this, the disparity between the depiction of men and women in our images of the past, in particular of the Mesolithic. Uh, and it's, and, but, of all the characters depicted that you can actually see in the museum displays I looked at, we're actually doing pretty well. 
Uh, in the British museums, the nine British museums I looked at, there were 29 actual individual characters you could identify, 15 on men, 14 on women. On the continent, there were 28 characters, and it's and half and half, 14 men, 14 women. And that actually is to the credit of, of, of the museums. They're well ahead of the game. In comparison with pictorial illustrations of the period I looked at, where uh, some 90% of the illustrations had men in them, but only 60% of the illustrations had women in them. I also looked at, for example, at fiction, novels and short stories. Uh, and if you look at all the identifiable characters in novels and short stories, 64% are male and only 36% female. So museums are actually ahead of the game on this and, and good on them for that. Now when it comes to looking at the mimetic story world, how good were the museums that actually portrayed the sites of the environments in which the Mesolithic people lived? This is actually quite hard in many ways. Uh, the Scarborough Rotunda Museum, the, the, the finds are displayed against the backdrop, which I pop on here, it's very, very hard to see and take a photograph on. Uh, a, a, a pictorial illustration of the site of Star Car, the settlement by the lake. So the finds are set against the background of the environment. Um, at the Yorkshire Museum, the whole wall <coughs> behind the cases is painted as they fixed them, with the messaging sites around it. And within the Yorkshire Museum, coming out from one wall is an actual tent, from inside of which are the sounds of someone knacking through tools. So again, that, that's a, a nice piece of sort of mimesis coming in. At Schloss Gotthoff, where we have some dioramas, full-scale big dioramas within the displays. And here we have a, an Esberla settlement beach with a canoe drawn up on the beach and the depiction of, of the surrounding environment. Uh, at Jöteborg, I've already mentioned the sand with the human footstep, footsteps within which the display cases are set. Uh, my, my personal favourite, uh, Medve Krumina, uh, you walk into the museum and you walk through a woodland from season to season. And the seasons are indicated by the colour within the displays and the activities going on and the activities at the right time of year with uh, the environments represented uh, with activities represented, reproductions you can touch which are out in the open, and with a settlement at the end by the beach set out in the open without a glass partition as though the people had just got up and left. And my, one of my personal favourites in the more science part of the displays, this column of plastic full of the equivalent of Mesolithic mid waste shells, leather, etc., etc., with a stopper which you pull off and you smell. And you can smell the Mesolithic mid. And the reaction, when I was there, I was there when a school party was going round, and the reaction of the school children to that was actually wonderful. It's like, oh, God, it stinks, you know. Whatever the Danish equivalent is, God, it stinks. So a really fine effort at mimesis there at Bedbeg. Uh, at uh, Klosterland, I went to the Pizzetti Stenhoff School in Klosterland, where the museum is actually set within Birch Woodland. So it's, and, and it's by a lake, and it's portraying finds from a Mesolithic site in Birch Woodland by a lake. So the actual site itself of the museum is part of that mimetic experience of the story world, which is an approach which, which they're very lucky, not many museums could do that. At Cheddar Gorge, in the outside of the museum, we have an activity space with which they try to recreate areas of, in this case, Lake Paleolithic, but also Mesolithic, little environmental scapes where they do activities with schools and children. And then at Archeon, the ultimate in Mimesis, you walk through the birch woodland from the entrance and you come out into the Mesolithic settlement. Uh, based on excavations of Berbumer in, in Friesland, with a lake, with canoes, which they let the children just leap in and paddle up the lake. <laughs> yes! Oh, I asked them, what do you do if any of them fall in? So, oh, well, it's not happened, but if they do, we just walk in and pull them out. <laughs> I, this is brilliant. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, you can go into the houses, there's more than one house reconstructed, 
Uh, they hold events where they might the fire, they'll have special activities where they prepare food, etc., etc. And you do really walk back into Mesolithic times. Uh, now, what do I derive from all of this? Well, I think, well, this, this is at uh, Beck Bay Kruger, this part where you go to the end and you see. I think you need to be evocative, evoke a sense of place. I think you need to make sure that place is lived in by real people. And that, therefore, once you do that, we can start to tell the stories of these people, the events of their lives, and then how these periods change over time through the eyes of the people living in them. So for me, it's about people and the settings which help make the museums really effective in, in, in telling that Mesolithic story. And for me, Vedbeck was mind-blowingly good at doing that. So thank you very much.